Hello everyone, David from Veganism Unspun here. Today I'm going to be responding to this video from the channel What I've Learned, and this isn't going to be a play-by-play -play debunking because the video in question is basically just the longer, more boring version of his previous video, literally word for word, scene for scene for about half the runtime. It's basically the director's cut that nobody asked for, and so practically every point has already been meticulously debunked in a bunch of different places, like here, here, here. You get the picture. But in stretching the runtime to 49 minutes, he did manage to include one or two extra bits of nonsense, so that's the stuff I'll be taking a sledgehammer to today. Let's take a look. But are cows really that bad? For this topic, I interviewed Professor of Animal Science and Air Quality Specialist Dr. Frank Mintliner. What's interesting is how this idea got started. The 2006 report that essentially got the world to start blaming cows for our environmental problems was called Livestock's Long Shadow. So basically, the claim is made that a 2006 FAO report called Livestock's Long Shadow was what started people worrying about the greenhouse gas emissions from livestock. And this isn't the case, and it's very easy to demonstrate as much. Here we even see an EPA report from all the way back in 1989, which states, Methane is increasing and will affect tropospheric air quality and global climate. Increasing methane concentrations directly and indirectly change the radiative properties of the atmosphere, contributing to the greenhouse effect. Animals, and in particular ruminants, are an important source of methane emissions on a global scale. Reductions in methane emissions from animals will assist in reducing the rate of methane increases, and may be one important component in attempts to stabilize atmospheric methane concentrations. So no, the FAO's 2006 report is not what started people being concerned about the link between emissions from livestock and global warming. Like I say, it's very easy to demonstrate as much. But the more interesting question is, why was this claimed in the first place? Well, it was claimed because it allows Dr. Mitt and Joey to give the false impression that such concerns all started over a misunderstanding since the 2006 FAO paper was somewhat flawed. The further implication being that if it all started over a misunderstanding, then we've got nothing to worry about. My understanding is that the idea that cows are bad for the environment started sometime around 2006 when this report called the Livestock's Long Shadow came out. I'm sure you're quite familiar with that. Can you tell me, tell us a little bit more about that? Uh, first of all, the FAO, the Food and Agricultural Organization of the United Nations, wrote a report called Livestock Strong Shadow. Some aspects of the report were done very well, and some of them were done chop-chop. They had some snappy comparisons in there, uh, such, such as the one comparing livestock to transportation. In the executive summary, they said livestock produces more greenhouse gases leading to climate change than the entire global transportation sector. They also said that livestock globally produces 18%, one eight, 18% of all greenhouse gases. The problem was that while they used this comprehensive cradle-to-grave so-called life cycle assessment approach for livestock, meaning they looked at everything from soil to plants to animals, the belching, the manure. They looked at the feed. They looked at the you know processing of meat and milk and so on, all the way till you put it in your mouth. That's the grave of that product, okay? But they didn't do the same thing for transportation. For transportation, they only looked into tailpipe emissions. So for livestock, they looked into everything, the so-called life cycle assessment approach, and for transportation, they only looked at tailpipe emissions. That was a classical apples to oranges comparison, which I critiqued in a peer-reviewed publication, and the authors conceded. They agreed with my criticism and took that comparison back. But the horse had left the barn and since then it's out, roaming freely and everybody who has a beef with livestock is grabbing it. Even though the authors had long clarified that that was uh, probably not the right approach. By the way, the 18% number of livestock's long shadow had since been reduced by the Food and Agriculture Organization to 145 so the long and short of it is that in 2006, the FAO said that livestock was responsible for 18% of global greenhouse gas emissions as CO2 equivalent. But whilst they were quite thorough in cataloging the various sources of livestock's emissions, they didn't do the same for other sectors such as transportation and electricity generation, etc. Hence, they underestimated the emissions from non-livestock sectors. Because of this, whilst in 2006 the FAO said that livestock accounted for 18% of anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions as CO2 equivalent, this figure would later be revised to 14.5% in a subsequent report released in 2013. 
And so Dr. Mitt and Joey are basically saying, we were worrying about nothing because 14.5 is not 18%. Therefore, everything is fine. Go back to sleep. Yeah, just one little problem. As you may recall me mentioning, the livestock emissions were quite thoroughly accounted for in the FAO's original estimates from 2006. It's only emissions from other sectors that were underestimated. Hence, that 18% figure from 2006 represents 7.1 gigatons of greenhouse gas emissions as CO2 equivalent. And the revised 14.5% figure quoted in the 2013 report also represents 7.1 gigatons of greenhouse gas emissions as CO2 equivalent. In other words, we're talking about the same thing. Livestock is literally no less harmful to the environment in either case. It's not like the FAO overestimated total emissions from livestock, they just underestimated emissions from other sources. So whilst the relative contribution went down a few percentage points, the emissions are still the emissions, and they still massively contribute to global warming. The 2013 report even makes clear that the livestock sector plays an important role in climate change. But that's not the message you're getting from Joey and Dr. Mitt. No, they are playing games of semantics in order to give the impression that because the FAO revised its 18% total contribution stat downward, that it somehow turned out that livestock wasn't a problem after all. This is of course staggeringly misleading, and it was a choice. It was a choice to use the percentage contribution figure and talk about how it was revised downwards. It was a choice not to mention the actual emissions those percentage figures represented. Was this a choice made in service of best informing you, the viewer? or in service of an agenda. In the United States, livestock is dwarfed by fossil fuel sectors, such as transportation, power production and use, and so on. So our livestock sector in the United States, according to the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, is 4%. Uh, if you do life cycle assessment, it's a little higher than that, but it's you know around maybe 5% in total. In a place like Paraguay, it's around 50. In a place like Ethiopia, it's around 90%. So here the point he's trying to argue is that since livestock emissions make up a relatively smaller percentage of total emissions in heavily industrialized nations, then it's really not worth focusing on emissions reductions through curbing livestock production in countries like the US. However, the fallacy of this line of reasoning is hinted at even in his own line of argument. I mean, it, again, it's not the case that absolute emissions from livestock are low in the US, it's only the case that emissions from other sectors are especially high. So, for example, according to the EPA, livestock in the US produces 260 million metric tons of greenhouse gas emissions as CO2 equivalent each year. Now, that's more than the emissions from all sectors, transportation, agriculture of all kinds, electricity generation, and land use change in the nations Dr. Mitt mentions, Paraguay and Ethiopia. So, even if Paraguay and Ethiopia stopped 100% of all greenhouse gas emissions from all sectors, it still wouldn't have as big as an impact as the US simply halting livestock production. So it's a bit cheap for a scientist based in the US, the richest nation in the world, to say, hey, why should we have to change our livestock emissions when a larger percentage of the emissions of poor developing nations like Ethiopia are attributable to livestock? What I find interesting when talking to colleagues who are, uh, or people who are in, in, into veganism, the greatest challenge they have in the vegan society of the United States is what they call a low retention rate. And what that means is that 84%, 84, 84 of all vegetarians and vegans stay that for one year and then they revert back. So when I ask some of their executives, well, how come? I mean, if this is such a profound change in lifestyle and you know, so positive to people, why would they only stay with it and stick with it for a year? And uh, because I never figured this out, is this because of nutritional deficiencies? Is it because of taste? Uh, I never got an answer for that. So first of all, this 84% figure, whilst interesting, comes from just one study, and other studies give a very different picture of recidivism rates. For example, data from the Ethic Oxford study shows that 73% of people who identified as vegetarian or vegan in the 90s uh, were still adhering to those lifestyles more than 20 years later. In other words, only 27% quit rather than 84%. And there's a great in-depth breakdown of this issue by Dr. Alex Lockwood, which you can read over at Plant Based News, and it is worth reading. But the study which the 84% figure comes from is still an important data point and certainly worth exploring. However, if Dr. Mitt had actually read the original study rather than just presenting this information as a rumor he heard about the vegan society, 
then he'd know that nutrient deficiencies were not found to be a significant cause of recidivism. The authors actually determined that the primary reasons people quit the vegetarian and vegan diets were inconvenience and social pressure. And the study authors make the point that therefore, as the number of people reducing meat and other animal products continues to grow, adhering to a vegetarian or vegan diet may become easier because new vegans will face fewer sources of inconvenience. I mean, just look at how many vegan options you have at restaurants and in supermarkets today as compared to seven years ago. Even if you're not vegan yourself, you couldn't have failed to notice this explosion in options. The authors similarly suggest that the more people go vegan, the greater the social support they will receive, and the less adherents will, quote, stick out from the crowd in ways that make them uncomfortable. So basically, the statistics on recidivism were high in this study, and the results are certainly valuable and worth thinking about, but this 84% figure is not set in stone. Rather, we can expect the rate to drop significantly as more and more people switch to a plant-based diet. Now, the other theory Dr. Mitt threw out as to why people might quit a plant-based diet was because of taste. And to be fair, here he actually did hit on something, because according to the study, this was a regularly cited reason for recidivism. Interestingly though, part of this equation was cravings for animal source foods, which may have less to do with the plant-based diet and more to do with the addictive qualities of animal products. And Mike the Vegan has some interesting videos on that topic, so go check them out. However, boredom with food options was also cited as a reason. And whilst this is of course concerning, it's more a matter of what the new adherent to the plant-based diet knows versus what options are actually available. It can be difficult to transition when you're staring at an empty recipe book. But once again, the more popular veganism becomes, the more vegan cooking channels pop up on YouTube, the more recipe blogs there are, the more vegan cookbooks come out. We're at a point now in 2021 where there's practically no animal product inclusive meal which can't be replicated on a vegan diet. You can have vegan omelet, vegan burger, vegan pizza, vegan ribs, vegan sushi. Just type in the name of any dish you can think of plus the word vegan into an internet search engine and see for yourself. You can even have vegan haggis if that's what floats your boat. So basically, yes, the study found that 84% of people who try a vegetarian or vegan diet will quit the diet. But that statistic is not prescriptive. It's simply a reflection of how difficult it is to swim against the current of mainstream culinary culture. And the more popular veganism becomes, the more that figure is going to shrink. It's certainly not a reason to throw up your hands and say, ah, veganism is untenable, therefore we might as well just raise all this livestock and just try to reduce their emissions as best we can, rather than eliminate them altogether. You have to understand um, that there is a fundamental difference between plant-based foods and animal-based foods. And the fundamental difference is that animal source foods are very nutrient dense, very nutrient dense. If you look at an egg and the nutrients contained in an egg or the nutrient. Okay, I just have to pause the video here. What is wrong with the what I learned guy? Seriously, what's the agenda? So Dr. Mitt is telling us how nutrient dense animal source foods are. And to illustrate his point, he says, if you look at an egg, so in post-production, Joseph looks at an egg. He sees that it's actually not very nutrient dense. So instead of putting the nutritional profile of an egg on screen, he throws up the nutrients you get for three eggs. And he briefly indicates this information at the bottom of the screen and then removes it. He doesn't even leave it up. This is so deceptive. So you're hearing, if you look at an egg, you're seeing a picture of an egg, but the values are the values of three eggs. What a class act. If you look at an egg and the nutrients contained in an egg, or the nutrients contained in a glass of milk, or the nutrients contained in a three ounce serving of beef, they are so nutrient dense with all the essential macro and micronutrients in a form that's highly digestible to humans. All the essential macro and micronutrients. Really? So let's start with macronutrients. This should be relatively straightforward. There's only three of them after all, protein, carbs, and fat. So here's his egg, half a gram of carbs. Here's his three ounces of beef, zero carbs. So not all the essential macronutrients, eh? Still, two out of three is basically the same as all, right? Milk, of course, does contain carbs as simple sugars, so at least he was right about that. As for the claim that animal products like milk, beef, and eggs contain all the essential micronutrients, I think he may be overlooking something. What's that nutrient? Ugh, you know the one. It causes you to die horribly if you don't get enough. Um, vitamin C, that's it. The thing you need to stave off scurvy, one of the most horrific, yet easily preventable, diseases there are. 
Jonathan Lamb describes the symptoms thusly in an interview for National Geographic. The main physical symptom of scurvy is the disintegration of the body. The skin begins to break. It starts with little blood blisters and develops into full-scale ulcers. The gums begin to putrefy and become black. Bones that had previously broken re-break. And it only gets worse from there, if you can believe it. So, unless you're eating your meat raw or going out of your way to eat specific organ meat such as spleen or pancreas on a regular basis, then this will happen to you on a diet of meat, milk and eggs. That's because, unlike carnivores, which are able to synthesize vitamin C in their bodies, we dropped this ability from our evolutionary toolkit about 40 million years ago and suffered no ill effects. Long distance voyages prior to the 20th century accepted. This is because we've always had plant-based foods which are high in vitamin C as a staple in our diet. Still, all micronutrients is basically the same as all except that one that causes you to die in agony if you don't get it, right? Finally, the claim that animal source foods are highly digestible is suspect to say the least. For those that don't know, human digestion runs on fiber. It's the lubricant that keeps the digestive system moving. Without it, you get constipation. And of course, fiber is notable for its absence in animal source foods, hence why constipation is now a common problem in industrialized nations. Indeed, so much so that last year the UK government had to put restrictions on the sale of stimulant laxatives due to chronic overuse in the general population. This is where we're at as a society now. People can't even defecate without popping a pill anymore. The claim that animal source foods are highly digestible is also at odds with the fact that around two thirds of people worldwide and about a third of people in the US suffer with lactose malabsorption. Lactose malabsorption occurs when non-hydrolyzed lactose, that's the sugar in milk and dairy products, passes through the intestines without being absorbed, thus acting as a bacterial substrate in the colon and frequently causing osmotic diarrhea. Yeah, so calling dairy products highly digestible when a third of Americans and two thirds of the world can't digest the sugars in dairies seems like a bit of a stretch. My friends who are critical of animal source foods, uh, some of them say, well, we need to have a meat tax, for example. They say we need, we need to make meat and milk and so on more expensive so that people stop eating it. So let's say our meat or milk were 30% more expensive. Would I eat less? meat or milk if it were 30% more expensive? No. And most people who I know would not eat less. The people who would eat less are those who already don't eat a lot of it because they can't really afford it. And these are those who are relatively disadvantaged, okay? The relatively poorer parts of the population. They are not calorie deprived currently. They are nutrient deprived. They're eating a diet that's very high in calorie, a very calorie rich diet, leading to very high rates of obesity in the poor part of the population. The last thing we want to do is make it more impossible for them to afford nutrient dense food and be reliant upon calorie dense food only. So here Dr. Mitt suggests that if we introduce a meat tax, then poor people will be forced to eat more Cheetos. This is of course a complete non sequitur, and there's no evidence to support this claim. If meat becomes more expensive, it could just as easily be said that the poorest in society will eat more beans to compensate, and presumably any meat tax would be accompanied by some sort of education campaign to ensure that this latter scenario prevails. Dr. Mitt also gives the impression that calls for a meat tax are made only on the basis of the environmental cost of producing meat. But that's simply not the case. Many call for a meat tax to offset the cost of society exacted by the health effects of meat consumption. As explained by Springman and colleagues, according to our model projections, the consumption of red meat was associated with 860,000 deaths globally in the year 2020, and that of processed meat with 1,530,000 deaths. They describe how about two thirds of attributable deaths were due to stroke for red meat and coronary heart disease for processed meat followed by type 2 diabetes mellitus and colorectal cancer. In the paper, the author suggests that one potential policy response is to regulate red and processed meat consumption similar to other carcinogens and foods of public health concern. This is nothing new. We already do this with alcohol and cigarettes. These taxes are there to both discourage consumption and offset the costs associated with the healthcare burden to society that their consumption entails. So what the researchers did is they calculated exactly how much the meat products would need to be taxed in order to offset these health costs, the health costs associated with their consumption. 
They basically wanted to know how much you'd need to tax them to break even. And what they found was that in high income countries, this would necessitate a 21% tax on red meat products and a 111% tax on processed meats. In other words, the corporations that sell meat products have traditionally externalized these healthcare costs, placing the burden on the consumer and society at large. But if these costs had to be accounted for at the point of sale, the price tag on red meat products would be 21% higher and processed meat would be over double its current price. So Dr. Mitt wants to give the impression that the poor will suffer from a meat tax since they eat Cheetos and candy instead, when in reality they suffer because of meat consumption and pay a hidden cost for the habit, a habit that a meat tax would be expected to discourage. If you ask me, and I know you do, otherwise you wouldn't call me, how I feel about this whole discussion around food and its environmental footprint and blah, blah, blah. Um, I have to tell you, food is a very personal decision. What you eat is your personal decision, just like it is who you marry, if you marry, or who your partner is, or who you vote for, or what you drink, or um, and so on and so on. The list goes on and on. These are personal decisions in life, and nobody has the right to make these decisions for us. So this is a distraction exercise. He wants to shift focus away from the consequences of what we choose to eat and onto the right to choose only. And this is a tactic straight out of Big Tobacco's playbook. Here we see an advert from Philip Morris in the early 90s, and it's all about personal choice. To smoke or not to smoke. At Philip Morris, we believe people should be able to make the choice they feel is right for them. The important thing is that no matter what people decide, they have a right to their individual choice. Notice how the important thing isn't millions of people getting lung cancer whilst Philip Morris continues to profit. And we have to remind ourselves this is in response to proposed legislation for no smoking areas in restaurants and other public places. Again, they care nothing for the rights of non-smokers to breathe unpolluted air. Here's a similar ad from the Tobacco Institute of New Zealand, and this one's from the early 80s. Who's going to speak up for smokers' freedom of choice? The fact is that there's a minority of vociferous people all too willing to speak out against smoking. Through tactics of misinformation and emotionalism, smoking has become a popular target for unsubstantiated attacks. Hey, this is basically the transcript to the What I've Learned video, just replace smoking with eating meat. The article continues, Smoking has never been scientifically proven to cause the many ills allegedly attributed to it. Allegedly attributed? Anyway, they quickly move away from the consequences of smoking, which might inform a person's choices, back to the right to choose. Only one person should decide whether you smoke, you. Here's another, this one's from the RJ Reynolds Tobacco Company. We've never smoked, but it was our choice, not the government's. Again, we have to keep in mind, this is simply in response to proposed tax increases on cigarettes in the early 90s. Heck, RJ Reynolds even produced a magazine called Choice, where of course the focus was on the freedom to smoke in various places, rather than the effects of smoking. Similarly, there was the Free Choice newsletter from Forrest, that's the Freedom Organization for the Right to Enjoy Smoking Tobacco, which was of course a fake grassroots or astroturf organization set up with big tobacco money. I believe I've made my point. The industry just keeps hammering home the idea that you should be free to choose whether or not you smoke, and hence they conflate tobacco taxes or advertising bans with an attack on that freedom of choice. But behind it all is an unscrupulous industry which is killing its customers and couldn't care less about their freedoms. Wait, which industry were we talking about again? Hard to keep track sometimes. My name is Frank Mitwener, and I'm a professor and air quality specialist in the Department of Animal Science at UC Davis. Oh. So I already talked a little bit about Dr. Mitt and his biases in my last video, so go check that out if you haven't already. But another thing I learned since looking through Dr. Mitt's past research is how utterly inconsistent he is about the impact that livestock emissions have on the USA and the planet as a whole. So back in November of 2020, Dr. Mitt tried to drum up a lot of media fanfare for the fact that under highly controlled conditions, some dairy producers in California working with UC Davis researchers managed to reduce their methane emissions by 25%. And here's what Dr. Mitt had to say about it. Can it be done? It can be done, and it has been done. Here in California, for example, we have been able to reduce methane by 25%. The way we reduce this 25% methane in California is through manure management changes. 
if you reduce methane, you induce a strong cooling effect. So meaning cattle being an important part of the solution to reduce our overall impact on climate. Did you hear that? If you reduce methane emissions from livestock, you get a strong cooling effect. Who is this imposter? And what has he done with the Dr. Mitt from the What I've Learned interview? Doesn't he know that emissions from livestock are meaningless? By the way, the press release that accompanies this video is astounding. He essentially tries to get the media on board with the idea that whatever methane livestock in the US are producing right now should be considered the baseline and that therefore reducing emissions by 25% through better manure management shouldn't be interpreted as making livestock 25% less harmful as far as global warming is concerned. Rather, it should be considered to be an actual positive effect that, quote, cattle can be part of a climate solution. So in terrifying Orwellian fashion, he tries to reinterpret being less harmful as actually being beneficial. It'd be like poachers killing 25% fewer elephants one year and then claiming they're part of the elephant conservation solution. But underneath it all, we're talking about 25% less methane from dairy in California by basically throwing a tarp over the lakes of fecal matter that accompany all large industrialized dairy operations and harvesting the methane gas. Yet in his interview for What I've Learned, Dr. Mitt dismisses the impact that reducing emissions from livestock by 100% would have. He seems to suggest that such a change would be practically meaningless, not worth doing, hashtag let them eat steak. But now just a 25% reduction in methane emissions, not even all CO2 equivalent emissions, and from dairy alone, not even all livestock. And he's talking about a powerful cooling effect and putting together press releases talking about this being part of a climate solution. I believe that's what you call a um, double standard, that's it. It almost seems as if he's more interested in reducing emissions whilst ensuring the survival of the livestock sector than he is reducing emissions per se. But uh, why ever should that be the case? Well, one interesting clue might be that Dr. Mitt is the leader of something called the CLEAR Center at the University of California, Davis. That stands for Clarity and Leadership for Environmental Awareness and Research. And whilst the name might not tell you much, this cover photo tells you everything. The purpose of this little outfit is seemingly to make livestock farming look as wholesome as possible. Unsurprising given that it was set up using a philanthropic gift of an undisclosed amount from the Institute for Feed Education and Research, or iFeeder, which is basically the PR branch of the American Feed Industry Association, but a branch which has been budded off into a separate entity so that it can get a non-profit designation from the IRS. See, it's not just the livestock industry which is keen for Dr. Mick to keep putting out his message of livestock emissions aren't a problem, ignore every scientist except me, eat more beef. The feed industry, in relying on the livestock industry, is equally invested in this message. No livestock industry, no livestock feed industry. So they've given an undisclosed sum to the University of California Davis to set up the Clear Center. And then the Clear Center with Dr. Mitt at the helm puts out information about how great livestock farming is. So the feed industry spending is not actually charity, it's investment. It's not philanthropy in the traditional sense, it's what's known as efficient philanthropy, which is essentially money invested in social engineering activities. See, the feed industry has a vision for the world they want to see, and that's a world where there's plenty of livestock which need plenty of feed. And boy, are they happy with their investment in UC Davis. This is from the iFeeder 2019 to 2020 annual report. Collaborative research initiatives like the relationship with the CLEAR Center at UC Davis address current issues in animal agriculture, providing science-based answers to make animal agriculture more sustainable, and addressing consumer interest issues such as environmental concerns is imperative to the future of our industries. At Zinpro, we believe iFeeder plays a critical role in this future. That's a quote from Terry Ward of the Zinpro Corporation. That's a company which makes nutritional supplements for livestock. Terry makes clear that if their industry is going to survive, to have a future, then they need to address consumer concerns about the environmental problems associated with the livestock industry. The Clear Center is becoming a leader in science communication thanks to the credibility of the center's director, Frank Mitlerner, PhD. It's fantastic, you just give an undisclosed sum to UC Davis and you get credibility in return. Credibility for the message that livestock farming is A-OK. -okay. <laughs> so the orders for livestock feed keep rolling in and everybody wins. Dr. Mitt and the Clear Center occasionally also accept money directly from livestock producers such as the National Pork Board or the National Cattlemen's Beef Association, as well as the manufacturers of various livestock farming equipment such as DeLaval and Alltech. 
but the funding from these sources seems quite small relative to others. One has to assume that taking large sums from entities such as these would begin to erode the credibility of the centre, which of course, as Terry makes clear, excuse the pun, is the source of its great value to these stakeholders. So, in conclusion, how shall I put this? Joseph, what I've learned, whatever you want to be called, stop doing the livestock industry's work for them. It's embarrassing. You are presumably not getting undisclosed sums from the American Feed Industry Association. You're just a level seven susceptible with a YouTube channel and they're using you to the detriment of our planet. So please take a step back and re-examine what you're doing. For everyone else, thanks for watching and just remember, you heard it straight from the horse's mouth. If you reduce methane, you induce a strong cooling effect. A strong cooling effect. A strong cooling effect.